I'd best not be too forward in this condition. Tell me, are you a goddess or a mortal maiden? I've never seen a girl so fair as you. You seem like Artemis, great Zeus's daughter. I'm afraid to hold your knees and beg for your mercy, yet my plight is desperate. I've been on the sea twenty days, riding the great swells through gale winds. I've been on the sea twenty days, riding the great swells through the gale winds to escape the island of Logigia. Yesterday, the storm wrecked me and left me stranded upon the shore. I pray you take pity on me. Tell me where I am and give me some scrap of clothing to wear, and in return, may the gods grant you all that you desire. Stranger, I can tell by your words that you are neither a fool nor a rascal. If the gods wish you to suffer, there is nothing to be done but endure it. But here on this island, you will not lack for hospitality. My name is Nausicaa. We are the Phaeacians, and this is our island, which is ruled by my father, King Alcinous. Come back, cowardly maids. Remember that all beggars are sent by Zeus. Let's feed this man, bathe him in the river, and give him a clean, dry tunic and cloak to wear. Let me wash myself, princess. I'm embarrassed to let any high-born woman touch my wrinkled skin and salt cake hair. Well then, when you've bathed and eaten, we will show you the way to town. I'll lead you part way, but when we approach the town, you must wait. If you followed me by the docks, the sailors would gossip. Just go straight across the causeway, enter the palace, and go into the great hall. Look for my mother, sitting beside the king, weaving by the light of the hearth fire. She's the one you should approach. Speak fairly and ask her mercy. Once you have her sympathy, you can be sure that you will soon see your home again. Palas Athena, sleepless daughter of Zeus, hear my prayer. Let these Phaeacians receive me with kindness and help me reach my home. Noble queen, hear my plea. Show your great generosity. A more piteous man you have never seen than I who kneel before you now. Years of troubles, countless heartaches I've endured upon the sea. And now I'm wrecked upon your shore. All I want is to see my homeland again, my family and my high roofed hall. Rise, stranger, you speak well. Zeus watches over all beggars and to honor him, we will grant your plea. Fear no more. Our ships and our sailors have no equal. Fear no more. Our ships and our sailors have no equal among mortals, and they will speed you safely home across the sea. Stranger, it is true. I will command a ship to be ready tomorrow. But first, enjoy our hospitality. Join our feast, and when you have eaten, you can tell us your name and where you came from. And where you got those clothes, for I'd swear I myself wove that cloak for my son. O oh, great king and queen, you are matchless in your generosity, beauty, and wisdom. May the gods bless you always with health, long life, and happiness for all your children, especially your lovely daughter, Nausicaa. It was she I first encountered on this island, and when I begged for her help, she gave me these clothes and helped me find your palace. She would have brought me here herself but the wise girl knew that the tongues would wag. As for the rest of my story, it is long and weary, painful for me to even think of. Friends, our guest is tired. Let's go to bed. Tomorrow we will ready a ship and hold a farewell feast for him with games, dancing, and gifts. I will have my servants prepare a bed for you. Book eight, the games. Patience, this stranger was wrecked on our island and came to me seeking help. We will take him home, but first, let's show him that we excel not only in shipbuilding, 
but also in sports, games, dancing, and celebrating. Friend, you look like a sporting man. Look at those thighs, those hands. Would you care to join in, try your strength? No, I'd best leave it to you, young pups. Leodamus, I see we were mistaken. He's probably a merchant, not used to carrying his own goods. Those are foolish words, my friend. A man may look like nothing much, but be gifted by the gods in song or strategy. Who knows? As for me... Brrr, thud. And I'll throw another just as far, or farther, if you like. For that matter, if anyone here cares to test his strength in wrestling or boxing, I'll knock him down. Peace now. Rest easy, stranger. I don't blame you for your anger. Euryalus spoke like a fool, and you've shown him up. It's time to put aside these contests and show you what else we're famous for. Dancing! King Alcinous, you bragged of your men's dancing, and you were right to do so. They are magnificent. Stranger, your manners are godlike. Come, princes and nobles, let's send our new friend home with rich gifts to amaze his countrymen. Bring them to my hall, and we'll have a farewell feast. Euryalus, you should apologize and give him a gift, too. I was wrong to taunt you, stranger, and I'm sorry. Please accept my apology and take this sword of bronze and silver with an ivory sheath to remember my friendship. Well spoken, Euryalus. I return your friendship and wish the gods' blessings on you. May you never have need for, his, for this sword. Here, take this to the bard. A bard's gift comes from the gods and we should honor it. Do, 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 do. Demogadus, your skill is divine. When you have eaten your fill, I pray you sing for us again. Stop, stop. It seems the song brings grief to our guest. Tell me now, friend, and hold nothing back. What is your name? Where do you come from? Why do you weep at these songs of Troy? Did you lose comrades there? A sinuous, it pains me to tell my story, but it seems you must pry into it, intensify my grief. Where shall I start? For the account of my troubles is long. I suppose I should begin by telling you my name. I am Odysseus, Laertes' son. The whole world knows of my stratagems, and my fame has risen to the heavens. My home is under the clear skies of Ithaca. Now I will tell you of the misfortunes that Zeus has sent me during my long voyage home from Troy. Book 9, Odysseus' story begins. The same wind that launched me from the beaches of windy Ilium after Troy's fall blew my fleet of ships to the land of the Sicones. We sacked the rich city for plunder, dividing the riches so each man had his proper share. Then I commanded the men to board our ships and sail for home, but they resisted. They wanted to stay and drink from the great cask of wine, gorge themselves on plundered delicacies. While I argued with them and they loitered, ignoring me, the Sicones, who had escaped the city, went quickly to their neighbors and gathered up an army to take revenge on us. They attacked with a force so numerous they were like the leaves in autumn. They drove us back to our ships, and I feared we might meet our end there. But we held them off long enough to launch our fleet and escape, though we lost six men from each ship's crew. We mourned the loss of our comrades, but we made good speed and would have reached Ithaca soon enough, except the north wind, stirred up by Zeus, pushed us off course, and we found ourselves in unknown waters. We sighted land and found a good harbor with fresh water. I sent a group of men out to see if any sort of people inhabited this sunny shore. But they did not come back. You see, this was the land of the Lotus Eaters. 
They made my men friendly offers of fruit from the lotus plant, which made them forget all their cares, forget their homes too, and want nothing more than to stay and enjoy the blissful euphoria this plant bestows. When I saw what had happened, I was dismayed, and I had to drag them forcefully back to the ships, ordering my other men to tie them beneath the benches and row quickly away. Lucky that I did not taste that fruit. As we sailed farther into the unknown seas, a fog descended, and for a time we could see nothing. Suddenly our ships ran up on a sandy beach. We found that we had sailed into a calm harbor, and we rested there thankfully for the night. In the morning we saw that we were on a small but lush island, with wild goats jumping among the rocks and a fresh stream running down the hill. We had soon brought down enough game for a fine feast, accompanied by the wine we had taken from the Sicones. As we ate, we eyed the rocky shore that stood across a narrow channel from us and saw cooking fires and other signs of habitation. I determined to go and see what sort of people lived there and ordered my ship readied while the rest of the fleet stayed securely in harbor. As we approached, we saw a great cave near the shore with sheep pens surrounding it. Something made me uneasy, so I picked twelve of my best fighters, armed myself well, and by some inspiration brought with me a cask of our best and strongest wine. We found the cave deserted and quickly explored it. It was huge inside. Part of it was divided into pens, which were filled with lambs and kids. There was a great fire pit, an array of pails and baskets for making cheese. Some of my men wanted to steal the fine cheeses and return swiftly to ship. But I was curious to meet the owner of this cave, see if he would offer us his spot hospitality. It would have been better if I had listened to them. Soon enough, we saw him. He returned to the cave, herding a flock of fat sheep and rams. When he had them inside, he picked up a massive stone slab that was lying by the entrance and slid it easily across the opening. His strength and bulk terrified us so that we cringed in the shadows as one by one he milked his fat ewes, curdling some of the milk for cheese and leaving two great pails to drink from. When he had put all their sheep in their pens, each suckling under its dam, he lit a fire and suddenly spied us. What? Strangers! Who might you be, little men? And what are you doing in my cave? Sir, we are travelers from afar who chanced upon your shore and found your cave. We humbly beg your hospitality. Remember that the guests are under the protection of Zeus. Zeus? <laughs> we Cyclopes do not fear the gods. What ship brought you here? Where is it anchored? Are there more of you? Sir, our ship was splintered upon the rocks as we, and we swam ashore. The rest of our comrades drowned in the icy waters. Uh... After devouring two of my men, the Cyclops lay down to sleep. He did not fear us, for even if we could kill him, we could not possibly move the giant stone. We were trapped. In the morning, the Cyclops killed two more men for his breakfast, then drove his sheep outside and replaced the stone across the entrance as easily as a man might cap a quiver of arrows. I racked my brain for a plan that would let us escape alive from the clutches of the brute. And this was what seemed best to me. There was a massive staff of green wood lying in the cave, and I whittled this down to a sharp point and hid it in the back of the cave. I picked four of my strongest men to help me wield it when the time came. Once again, I had to stand by and watch as he killed two more of my men to make his dinner. When he had devoured them, I approached him. Here, have some wine, monster. I brought it as a gift though that means nothing to you. I'll wager it's finer than anything you have here. Give me some more, stranger, and tell me your name, for I will make you a gift in return for this magnificent wine. 
Three times I filled the bowl, and he drained it empty. Then, when his wits were addled, I answered him, You ask my name, and I'll gladly tell it. I am called Nobody. Now, you said you had a gift for me. <laughs> Your gift, Nobody, is that I will eat you last. <laughs> Deeper. Twist. Ah! No! I'll get you! Polyphemus, what's the matter? Is someone attacking you or trying to steal your sheep? Nobody! Nobody's trying to kill me! Well then, if nobody's in there, you must be sick. There's nothing to be done about that except pray it to your father, Poseidon. No! Idiots! Oh! Come on now, nobody! Just try to escape! Now I cast about for a way to slip past him, and my eye fell on the great fleecy rams. I lashed them together in threes, with one of my men slung beneath. I saved the bulkiest of them all for myself, and digging my fingers into the thick wool, I swung beneath his belly and waited as the young dawn's fingers touched the eastern sky. <laughs> the animals were jostling and bleeding to go out into the pasture, but Polyphemus carefully ran his hands over each one's back before he let it out. He couldn't feel my men, though, shielded as they were. <laughs> Old friend, why are you last of all? You always lead the way. Is it because you grieve for my eye, put out by that accursed nobody after he got me drunk? Oh, if only you had the power of speech and could tell me where he's hiding, I'd smash his brains out. Cyclops, your victims have escaped, and the gods have paid you back for your crimes. Crack. Fling. Bloosh. The splash raised a swell that drove our ship almost back to the shore. My men rode furiously, keeping silent now until we were twice as far away. Then, ignoring their desperate pleas, I called back to the Cyclops again. Cyclops, if anyone asks who put out your eye, tell them it was Odysseus of Ithaca. Oh no, the old prophecy has come true. I was told Odysseus would rob me of my sight but I always expected some giant of a man, not a puny trickster like you. But I am Poseidon's son, and he will hear my prayer. Poseidon, Earthshaker, god of the sable locks, if I am indeed your son, grant me revenge on Odysseus of Ithaca. Let him never reach his home, or if the other gods decree that he must, let him come late. After long suffering with all of his comrades dead, and let him find trouble waiting for him at home. So he prayed, and the gods heard him. Then he seized another boulder, even bigger than before, and hurled it after us. But this time it landed behind our ship, and the wave pushed us swiftly forward until we came to the little island where our comrades were waiting. Book 10, Aeolus and Circe. The next land we sighted on our journey was strange in every way. It was a floating island walled all around with solid bronze. This, we discovered, was Aeolia, the home of King Aeolus, whom the gods had made Lord of the Winds. He had twelve perfect sons and daughters, whom he had married to each other, and they lived at ease within their bronze palace, feasting all day long. Aeolus welcomed me to their feast, and when I departed, he gave me a godly gift. He captured the winds and bound them up in a great bag made from the hide of a full-grown ox, sealing the neck tight with wire so nothing could escape. But he left the west wind free to blow us straight, to, straight on our course for home. I stayed up for nine days without a rest, manning the helm myself, for I was determined that nothing would stop me reaching home now. We sighted land, Ithaca. I thought my troubles were over, 
and I left the helm to sit and rest my legs. But sleep overcame me, and soon as my eyes were closed, mischief erupted among my crew. They took it into their heads that the bag Aeolus gave me must contain gold and riches, which I planned to keep all for myself. The fools, mad with jealousy, they decided to open the bag and see. I awoke to a nightmare. In my grief, I thought that I should cast myself overboard and drown rather than suffer such tragedy. But my spirit held me, made me cling to the rail, and endured all. The winds unleashed, battered our ship, and blew us wailing back from our homes, all the way back across the sea to Aeola. What? Odysseus? Back again? How can this be? I sent you on your way with all you needed to reach your home. Sir, my crew betrayed me. They opened the bag and released the winds. I beg you, great king, save me again. You have the power to do it easily. Pitiful man, the gods must truly despise you, and I will not go against their will. Leave my hall and never return. So we sailed on, cursing our fate. Six days we rode, and on the seventh we came to a shore of tall cliffs encircling a fine, calm, natural harbor. My captains all sailed in, but some instinct warned me to moor my ships outside the cliffs, tying her fast to the rocks. I climbed to the top of the cliff and saw smoke rising in the distance. Two of my men volunteered to go and see what manner of people lived there. They had not gone far when they met a great strapping young woman. She brought them to the hall of her parents, who were king and queen of these people, the Lastragonians. But they were treated to a savagely and beastly reception. Yeah. I called my men to cast off and retreat, but it was too late. Only my ship escaped. The rest were smashed and the Last Lastragonians speared my helpless men from the water like fish. So we sailed on, mourning our comrades as we came to another island where we moored our ship and took on water. We were all afraid to explore after our experience with the Cyclops and the Lastragonians. However, our food supply was getting low, so I strapped on my sword took hold of my bronze spear, and ignoring my crew's protestations, I set off to find some game. Friends, look, let's put away our hunger. When I told them, told the men that the island looked inhabited, they groaned, but I quickly divided them into two bands, one led by myself, the other by my captain, Eurolochus. We cast lots from our helmet, and Eurylochus's lot came first, so he and his band set off grimly to see who might live here. At the center of the island, they found a great house with a garden prowled by wild animals who acted as meek as house pets. They heard a beautiful voice singing within, drawn, la, 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 la. drawn by her song. My men went to the door and hailed her and she came out at once to greet them, the bewitching Queen Circe. Only Eurylochus held back, sensing a trap. Circe mixed them in bowls of a sweet concoction made of cheese, barley, golden honey, and Pramian wine. And into this, she also stirred a magic drug. Eurylochus had returned, rav raving about the men being transformed. His story was hard to believe, but it made me burn with curiosity. Though the men wanted to put to sea at once and escape, I made up my mind to see what had happened to my comrades, and rescue them if I could. Well, well, great Odysseus. Looking for trouble again? Let me give you some friendly advice, then. This island belongs to Circe, a powerful immortal. She has enslaved your men by magic. If you would seek her out, then take this herb with you. Chew it up and swallow it, and it will protect you from her spells. When her magic fails, she will try to seduce you. Threaten her with your sword. Make her swear never to harm you and to release your men. 
Then you can lie safely in her bed and enjoy the magical delights of the island for as long as you please. I found all as Eurylochus had described it. Now, into the pens with your comrades, you swine! Just as Hermes had said, she tried to seduce me, but I made her swear by all the gods not to harm me and to release my men. I brought up the others who waited at the ship, and we were all bathed, given royal clothes, and fed the choicest delicacies by Circe's handmaidens all day long, day after day. So we stayed, savoring all these pleasures while elsewhere the seasons turned and a full year passed. Then some of my men urged me to resume the voyage home, and I knew that they were right. Circe, I must not stay here any longer. Radiant goddess, give us provisions for the journey and tell me how to set my course. I will not hold you back, but if you wish to reach your home safely, you must have the advice of the great seer Tiresias. Tiresias is long dead and buried. Yes, you must journey to Erebus, the land of the dead, to consult him. No ship can sail to the land of the dead, nor can living men return from that shore. Do not fear. Remember, I have sworn an eternal oath to you. It is neither so far nor so hard as you think, and I will tell you how to make the journey. Go now, and gather up your men. I will provision the ship for you. I roused my companions, and they wept and wailed when I told them we must visit the land of the dead. But I hustled them down to the ship and put them to work, so their tears were stilled, for what good can come of grieving? 